the test to do with how you're seeing the world. What did they say? It's one saying, forgiveness. Forgiveness is the fragrance that the, that the violet sheds on the heel that has just crushed it. Mm. Whatever you have inside, that's what you're going to give. So you want to cut cords and free your heart up so that your heart is as light as a feather. Welcome, Belinda Farrell. Thank you so much for having me. I feel honored to be here. Thank you. It's an honor to have you here. <laughs> so what I would love to hear about is, is what, how did you discover this? Like what were you going through in your own life and, and how did this process of forgiveness speak to you? Well, I was taking a master course in hypnosis on the big island of Hawaii. I had no idea what I would come in contact with because I hadn't really been to Hawaii many times before. And um, some old Hawaiians came into our class and they brought their drum and their ipuheke and they wanted to teach us about how to let go of the past through some process they call ho'oponopono, which means to make right right. And I thought, ah, oh, sure, give it a chance. But after going through the process, Afterwards, I felt like something had lifted off of me, and I didn't know I was, I was bearing all this grief, but I guess I was, and it just got rid of it, and I wanted to learn more about it, and so I started hanging out with these Hawaiians, even though they didn't want this Howley to hang out with them, <laughs> and I started doing it on a regular basis, and it was just life-changing who knew that I would be, I'd be going for this process of a very linear method, you know, hypnosis and hypnotherapy, and end up doing what became my life's work, teaching people how to let go and to let their higher self create a whole new experience for them. Mm -hmm. So it was something that you, you had no idea it was even possible. You didn't even realize you were holding on to right. something. It was, we hold these things inside. And according to the Hawaiians, if you have an emotional attachment to something, you create cords or strings or these little ropes that tie you to that thing that you're emotionally attached to. And with lack of interest lack of emotion the cords dis dissipate they leave us in time but if not they build up and they can create havoc around your organs and cause disease so it's good i mean we brush our teeth every day why wouldn't we go inside and clean our stuff up that we've been accumulating for lifetimes and as you do that you become more into the present time and you gain more life force. And it is really the key to healing, I believe. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And so the thing that I love about it is that it actually doesn't get into people's stories about things. It gets them bigger picture and into their higher selves and seeing other people in their higher selves. And so it, it, it frees people up to look at things a different way. Oh, absolutely. Our judgments and our interpretations, they are just um, made at a time when we didn't have, I guess, all the information that we have now. So that's why when you cut the cord, and I do mine in the bathtub every night, every night I say the things to myself, I'll put myself down below. I'll put sometimes the problems of the world down below so that you can feel that you have some say in creating something more beautiful than what, the, than what we have right now. But you put all of these things down below you and you offer the forgiveness to yourself and just say, I'm sorry, I love you. I forgive you. Thank you. 
take a cutting instrument and spin it around you, and I usually take my hand and I watch them float away. Mm. And then you just feel, oh my gosh, I'm back to square one again. (laughs) Playfulness. Yeah, it's like renewal. It's totally renewal. But it, Mm. it goes into a place that the Buddhists call the void or the Akashic, and the Hawaiians called it the Eo, where everything begins again. It's the point of creation. So the Hawaiians taught us something very, very beautiful and very powerful. And they didn't have a lot of mental illness at the time that they were practicing this. They did cord cutting daily. I do it daily. It's just, again, it's like brushing your teeth. You're cleaning yourself on the inside. Why would you not want to look good on the inside? You do such a good job on the outside. Yeah, and when we brush our teeth, we don't really care what we're brushing off our teeth. That's true. What matters is they're clean. <laughs> Get that plaque off. That's right. Soul, the plaque of the soul. Mm-hmm. And I healed my back. That's what my book is about. Um, I couldn't do any work anymore because my back had gone into atrophy and it had nerve damage and I was really a mess. I was kind of an adrenaline junkie for a while. I was doing a lot of stunt driving. I was riding my bike. I was rollerblading and I didn't know how to rest. I didn't know how to rest. I didn't know how to really listen to my body. Mm-hmm. And when I collapsed with the herniated discs and nerve damage, the doctors said that I was never going to walk again unless I had surgery. But my insurance company had uh, canceled me because I couldn't work anymore. So I thought, okay, all these years I've been learning the HUNA, three years I've been studying it, I have to see if this really works. So that was my job, physician heal thyself. So I was confined to bed. I did Ho'oponopono constantly. I did a lot of ha breathing, which gave permission for my unconscious mind to bring up these old memories that had been lodged in my body and that I had no idea that they were even there because we don't take the time to really look at the stuff that we have buried. We bury it put it in the closet, lock the door, and don't want to see it again until it raises its... Ah! (laughs) And so many people have that kind of experience where they're running around the world and and filling up their life with a lot of distraction. Or maybe they're running away from themselves or running away from feeling or facing what they need to face. And... Yeah, and so your your body forced you. You didn't have a choice. You had to do something. It changed me completely. And I talked to my back and I thanked it for remembering how to support me. And that's when things shifted. I started to see myself climbing trees. And you have to have a strong back to climb trees. So I had to give my unconscious mind that image, that feeling. It's not just the words. You have to have the feeling so the unconscious mind can send that up the pipeline to the higher self. So the higher self, I guess, saw that and brought down into my physical body complete healing. Within three days, my back completely healed. Scoliosis that I was born with was gone. I had a completely back again. I went to the doctors. They could not believe what they saw. And I just felt like, wow, if I can heal myself, I can do anything. Yeah, that's that's a pretty amazing story. Yeah. It's in the book because it was such, it was so amazing to know that if we can take the time to do the breathing and allow these boxes, I guess, to open up so the unconscious can say, well, I wonder if she can handle this today and not try to stuff it down, but just really get some closure on it, that it will completely heal the inside of our body and give us 
guess the greatest gift you can give or help. Yeah. And so and and so the whole experience is very visual and energetic yes. that you go through with this. It's all in the senses. Exactly. And if somebody can't really see the pictures, they can feel it. They can feel what the what the tapes are that are running the films from their story because it's time to change the story. Change the story, change your life, as you know. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. So one thing I'd like to explore with you a little is we have a lot of students who come here and they're beginning hypnotists. Many of them go out and they, they build clinics and we help them to do that. And one of the things that I've noticed, and it's probably because our culture has this focus, is that early on they get very stuck in the client's story or their own story. And they, they're looking for um, a reason why they're stuck or a reason why they are the way they are. And so they get, it's kind of a red herring. They get, they think that's where the solution is. And this approach is, you know, so much more big picture. And I'm wondering if you could share with them your wisdom on how to make that leap to really trusting this other way of, of letting go, um, just embracing this whole new way of looking at things. Well, if they can put themselves down below on the stage with the belief system that they have presently going, if they're open to that, and they can forgive themselves the way they've been looking at it in the past, and cut the cords from that and watch that person leave, then they can come at a higher level to see it in a different way, in a different picture. But they have to be open to allowing themselves to cut the cords from the old way that they were investing in. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, and I'm sure you take them through a lot of cord cutting processes. Mm -hmm. It's an ongoing it's an ongoing thing because your mind is always creating new stories. For sure. And a lot of people really, uh, it, it, it feels or seems smart to them to understand things. And this has nothing to do with understanding. This mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, it's a whole different experience that goes way beyond what our conscious minds can do. Um, so I think sometimes they really get in their own way by needing to understand things or, or, or link things together that don't necessarily link together. They like to control and feel that they're, they've got the solution. And sometimes spirit comes in different forms and it gives them a different experience. They have to be open to what the divine is speaking through them. Mm -hmm. Throat. Many times they have um, symptoms around the throat. Do you find that? Mm -hmm. Thyroid problems or something. Yeah, that's really common. Mm -hmm. It's coming up from their gut and they want to speak the truth, but then they put a top on it and shove it back down. They have to be willing to just let go and... Let the divine speak to them. What would that look like? Mm -hmm. Gosh, I don't, en I don't envy your training. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think part of this is, is really being willing to, it's a really like there's no risk to doing it. It's no. a very safe and gentle and, and lovely experience no matter what happens. So being willing to let it happen and trust it and, and kind of be with the experience, choosing to do that, I think will help people a lot. And also it'll make them a better therapist because they can help their, their patients go through the same experience of letting go. Mm -hmm. Um, I find that it, you know, it's still a question of you open the door, they have to walk through. If they're not willing to walk through, you can't shove them. 
<laughs> sure, but I, I think some, I agree with you. And sometimes people are very well-meaning and they want to walk through, but their belief system or the structure, the glasses they've been wearing in their life can get in the way. So I, I, I tend to attract a lot of students like that. You know, my parents are medical doctors, so I come from a background that's much more, uh, you know, intellectual and uh, wanting to understand things. So for me, it was a stretch to really embrace this way of looking at things. So I do tend to attract students who who look at things that way as well. Interesting. I was married to an orthopedic surgeon for 18 years. Mm -hmm. He totally believed in science for everything. And I wanted to, I didn't know anything about healing naturally. I just knew I didn't want to take pills and I and that there had to be a better way. Mm -hmm. I was 40 and I got divorced, that I started looking at different modalities, and that's what brought me over to Tony Robbins and firewalking. And I did that 18 times after wow. I was married. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Good for you. Every year I was married. But there are things that we just can't imagine that we can accomplish. Like, how, how do you change your body so that you can walk on 2,000 degrees of hot coals and not burn? How, how is that possible? And when I was studying Huna, I realized that all we are is earth, air, fire, and water. And when you breathe in a certain way, you can change your breath to change your body, and it becomes hot like the coals. And so you can walk safely and not burn. Mm -hmm. so a lot of this is being willing to kind of shed whatever we've been how we've been culturally conditioned and go back to basics and really connect with just what we're made of and and the spiritual world in a really basic way well we're really hypnotized hypnosis of social conditioning i think that's what deepak chopra called it Mm -hmm. the hypnosis of social conditioning so we have to kind of wake up and wake up to our own belief that our bodies are amazing vehicles and that they can heal themselves and we can heal ourselves together with our higher self if we just let go cut the cords and start over again I think the cord cutting is probably the most powerful tool and instrument that you can give to anybody. And a lot of people who are worried about losing control, I would say that's in a lot of people's way, this is really going in the opposite direction where when we try to hang on tighter, if we're, we're worried about losing control and the whole energy of this is about letting go, right? It's going totally in the opposite direction. Um, that is so true. When I, when I used to hate the water. I couldn't stand being in the water. I was afraid of the water. And here I am in Hawaii surrounded by water. And I started to have dreams about the dolphins after I'd had a higher self-connection. And the dolphins were teaching me how to swim. They were teaching me how to get out there and to be with them. And as that happened, it opened up a whole new world for me because I started taking people to swim with the wild dolphins. And I started getting a little bit more um, confident about my own ability and one day I went out into the water I went out a little too far and I got caught in a current and I was starting to swim too fast and I was losing my my energy and I, I yelled for help and what come what comes next to me is this gigantic turtle mm. and I could feel and hear this turtle going do what I do and that wasn't struggling. It was just moving in a very succinct manner, the way the turtle was moving. I stopped struggling, and he took me gently over the current and dropped me over onto the rocks. He saved my life. Wow. And then on, I realized that whatever you try to fight, you're going to lose. You've got to go with that flow. 
whatever direction it's taking you, you just have to go with that flow and you'll be safe. Mm-hmm. That saved my life that day and I lose him. He's my other my other wonderful totem animal next to the dolphin. Wow, that's an amazing story. That's incredible. Yeah, that was yeah. that was all in Hawaii. And our emotions are deeply embedded in water, so we've got to be at peace with the water. And I was scared to death of those emotions. That's why I was afraid of the water and afraid of the ocean. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> were there other things that happened that helped you discover this, this surrender? Because it sounds like you had a time in your life where you were really holding on and wanting to control things and in a lot of fear. And so this process changed you. And were there other things that influenced you that way? Well, the animals certainly did. That one experience with the turtle and letting go. Um, I just take my time or I don't. I'm not in such a rush. I think it all has to do with getting older. You get a little bit more respectful for your time here on Earth. And I certainly have. I never thought I was going to get married again. And I got married in May of this year. I've been divorced over 30 years. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I couldn't be happier. So you never say never. Never say never. You don't know what time in your life you'll find the man of your dreams. And just, it's, it's just incredible. Mm-hmm. He does it in too. I think he does it naturally. Some people do it naturally. They don't realize um, that they're doing it, but they just put bad things behind them and they learn from them and then let them go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so get, being in this, this, this zone of, of moving with life instead of making things happen or fighting for things to happen. Like if we take the example of when you felt like you needed to prove you were worthy or accepted by people, you were fighting for that and everything changed for you when you realized, Hey, I'm already accepted. I don't need to prove that anymore. And, and I think that that's a, a really important discovery for people. It's true. But I mean, I, as a little girl, I used to love to entertain people on the bus. I would sing songs and go up and down the aisles and people would give me money. And so I learned early on that if I entertain, I get money. <laughs> so I, I decided that, you know, entertainment would be fun because it changed people's um, emotions. It made them happy or it made them sad. And that was fun to be able to control that in an audience. But I gradually got out of the need. There are a lot of actors that seem to need an audience to make them feel loved or make them feel happy. And so I just started doing it for fun and I didn't need it that much anymore. And my father died before I got a chance to meet him. But I'm sure my life would have taken a different route had I had him in my life. Mm-hmm. So I have to just be grateful for what I had. You can't go back. You have to focus on what's in front of you and let go and forgive yourself for the way you're looking at it. Create a different story. Mm-hmm. It's always yeah. kind of creating a story that you feel that you can win at. I remember Tony Robbins saying um, he was giving a lecture to these people who were very successful people, all CEOs of their own company, Fortune 500s, and they were all just very successful, but he asked the room, he said, how many of you feel that you're a success, that you're successful? And there were only like three or four people that raised their hands. And this one guy was in the back and he was like, pick me, pick me, pick me, pick me. And Tony asked him, why do you feel successful? And he said, every day above ground is a great day. He had been to the war. 
He had seen his friends come back in body bags. And for him, every day above ground was a great day. Mm. It's all he needed. Yeah, it's all perspective. (laughs) For sure. And you know, Belinda, it's interesting what you were saying about wishing that you had met your dad. Because I I have, you know, when I started to learn hypnosis and NLP, I remember feeling like, oh, why didn't I know this sooner? I wasted all those years. And I remember my trainer saying to me, well, if, if things had gone differently for you, you wouldn't be here to help other people. Because what drew me to learn this and to do this for myself was because I needed to clean my life up, right? I needed to learn things from my experiences. And so you've given so many people amazing gifts because of your experiences. That's true. And the Hawaiians gave me what they gave me. And I'm a little howly. They came back to learn the ancient teachings because they did not want to teach this howly the chants. The chants are very sacred, and I just feel that when people listen to them, they listen, their heart changes, and they, you go into a different perspective. It's like swimming with the dolphins. When you look into the eye of a wild dolphin, you're transformed. You fall in love. There isn't anything else but love, and that's all that's around you, and that feeling is just something that captures you mm. doesn't let go <laughs> makes me want to go back again oh then. yeah i know i want to go i've never swum with the dolphins but it sounds amazing oh my gosh. it is it is amazing when they choose you to come and play Another thing I'm really curious about is how did you convince the those Hawaiian people who were the the um, the the wise people who knew how to do Ho'oponopono beautifully? How did you convince them to teach you? I am a pest. <laughs> yes, I wouldn't go away. Um, I just convinced them after just showing up on this one teacher, my Kumu's doorstep four in the morning, five in the morning with my drum that I was really serious about learning. And I remember I was in the same, he, he taught me and he taught Tad James's son, Matt. We were both, I'd started out to do the hula, the hula, but then I wanted to do the drums. You can't do both. So I ended up doing the drums and then he taught me the words and, um, as I said, I just wouldn't go away. I was a thorn in his side. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so he decided to go with it at some point. <laughs> yeah, just get me out of here. <laughs> yeah, he was he was wonderful, and you just know when you're when something is right when it's pono, my like pono to make right right. When something is right, you have to keep pursuing it because it's your destiny. Yeah. So, yeah. Huh. And, you know, I had a client once who he was from Australia and his family was native Australian. And, and so when we did, we, I had him listen to your Pono Pono. And afterwards he said to me, you know, this is familiar in my family. We do something like this. So I'm wondering how, you know, maybe other native groups around the world are, you know, maybe there was a time when this was just the way that people did things. The woman, Morna Simeona, who's, she spread Pono Pono all around the world. She went around the world teaching this. She was in our class in the 90s. And so I either she spread it or they had the same, the 100th monkey syndrome, you know, when so many people know a certain, a certain thing, then everybody learns it. Right. It gets sort of embedded in the culture. And my impression from this client was that it had been in generations of his family, right? Like, it, like, even though he was from Australia, there was something in, in his culture where they looked at things this way as well. 
So I'm wondering if there was a time when this was just, you know, maybe it was hundreds of years ago or thousands of years ago that people were spiritually interacting with the world this way. And it was the way it was. Is he part Aborigines? Yes. You see, they they know. Yeah. They know. I would I would not be surprised to find out that they had the same kind of did they do it as a family or did they do it individually? He didn't really get into the details, but he was very familiar. And I would say he's not he needed a review because he certainly hasn't been living, you know, when he came to see me, he definitely needed help from this point of view. But once we did it, he was like, oh, yeah, this is familiar. This is part of my family. This is how we heal up and, and look at things. So I think that was pretty interesting. Yes. I, I think that's amazing. And I'd like to add it to my repertoire of information. <laughs> Ah, yeah, it might be interesting to research how do Aboriginal Australians do this. Yeah. Well, I know this used to be done just mainly as a family because my kumu, my teacher, he had uh, like 12 brothers and sisters. And one time his one of his brothers was found murdered and his money was stolen and the first thing the mother did was call the whole family together and do Ho'oponopono so they wouldn't grow any resentment towards what had happened. That was the most important thing to do. Yeah, well, that, that's really interesting because when you look at our culture, we're always looking at who's to blame. And our first reaction would be call the police and press charges and right and try. And, and so it's about judgment, whereas this way of doing things is really just about acceptance and letting go and focusing on what needs to happen next. Well, and also the Huna way is accepting 100% responsibility for whatever happens to you in your life. 100% responsibility. So if you feel that you're 100% responsible, then you can uncreate what you created. You have to be at cause rather than effect. Mm. And if somebody it's not going to get resolved right you're you're the only one who can change it anyway right you can't rely on other people to change it mind in your mind. that's right yeah and and the process helps people do that in a healthy way i i've seen many people including myself where if things aren't going well we may blame ourselves and and be upset with ourselves and judge ourselves for it which makes it even worse because then you're not freed up to learn or to do it any way because you're caught up in judgment so combining that 100 percent responsibility with this whole um, letting go and cutting the cords is what frees people to grow in a useful direction. And it can be thousands of miles away, they can feel it. That's what's so beautiful about it. It has to do with how you're seeing the world. What did they say? It's one saying, forgiveness. Forgiveness is the fragrance that the, that the violet sheds on the heel that has just crushed it. Mm. whatever you have inside that's what you're going to give so you want to cut cords and free your heart up so that your heart is as light as a feather just knowing that people come to you that they're guided too knowing that you're going to help them I'm sure your company is an absolute wealth of people that drop in your transformation. Yeah, well, I love what I do because I know what it's done for me. So I love passing it on to other people and showing them what's possible. And that's why I do what I do, <laughs> for sure, right? You want to have a reason to be here. So you're, you know, when you said you leave, you leave this world and this life with your heart as light as a feather, if we were going to look at success, if everybody were to look at it that way and do the cord cutting in that direction, the world would definitely be a different place. Gosh. Well, I'll just keep imagining what that looks like. And the more that you imagine it, the more it becomes real. 
Mm -hmm. Share with people how they can reach you and, and about your book and where they can get the book or the Chant and Forgiveness audio if they're interested in learning more. Well, I have a website. It's Huna Healing, H-U-N-A-H-E-A-L-I-N-G dot com. And they can get the um, MP3s of the three chanting tapes that I have, Chant and Forgiveness, Enchantment, and Sleepy Time Chant. And the MP3s are only located at my website. Um, Amazon carries the book Find Your Friggin' Joy. And that has also the chants written out. So if somebody really wants to learn, learn them, that chant is written out. And you can follow it. So that's it. <laughs> <laughs> we get the dolphin laugh. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. So, and if people are interested in learning more about how hypnosis can help you heal or forgive or let go, or, or how you can help other people with hypnosis, you can go to hypnosistrainingcanada.com. We have lots of free resources there. Um, and if you're ready to, to get some direct feedback and, and learn how to do this for yourself or for your family and friends or as a professional hypnotist, we can set up a time to meet one-on-one -on -one and see if this is a good fit for you. That is exciting. Do you do stage hypnosis as well? I do. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a lot of fun and we teach stage hypnosis. So in the approach that we take as part of Master Hypnotist Society, that whole stage hypnosis uh, experience is, is a, an important one to be able to help clients better in the clinic because we want to bring that energy to what we do and that, that mystery to what we do. It helps people a lot. And I'm sure you've seen that in your work as well. You're a magician. You're a magician of light and magic. <laughs> yeah, as are you. <laughs> it's one to know one, that's right. <laughs> that's right. And so are the dolphins and that amazing turtle that saved you. And there's so many magicians out there. This is really about respect for that magical part of life and learning how to, to embrace it. And letting go and letting something even more divine come in and just be on an adventure because it is an adventure if you look at everything brand new as an adventure you'll uncover things and you'll and i would never have become a stunt car driver had i not listened to that little stall still small voice in my in my gut that said you want to drive a race car and sure enough it turned into an eight-year career yeah, wow, that must have been really interesting. <laughs> Most fun I've had <laughs> in my 40s. So you're never too young, never too old to start anything. You just have to decide that that's what you're going to do and do it. Don't let anybody spoil your dreams. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you may as well make the most of being here. That's right. Having fun helps you learn and discover in amazing ways. It also can help us have a sense of humor about ourselves. On next week's podcast, we will explore ways to have a fun attitude while making important life changes with hypnosis. And you can find out more about how hypnosis training can help you at hypnosistrainingcanada.com. You will find fantastic learning resources and free giveaways here. You can also book a free admissions consultation to see if hypnosis training is right for you. Remember to click the button to subscribe, share the podcast with a friend, and please leave us a review so you can help others benefit from the podcast too. Until next week. You've been listening to The Hypnosis Show with Robbie Spear Miller. Tune in next time to learn more about how you can change your life with hypnosis. And if you are interested in learning more about training opportunities, go to hypnosistrainingcanada.com and schedule a free consultation.